Okay, and we are live. Okay, great. Thank you, Dallas. Uh, welcome everyone to the April 7th, 2022 Historic Preservation Commission meeting. Um, <clears throat> as you've noted, we are still holding this meeting remotely. Uh, we'll have some further instructions for you, uh, those in the public later on. Let's go ahead. Uh, we'll call the meeting to order. And can we, uh, Ms. Hills, can we have the roll, please? Chairman Lane. Here. Commissioner Hardy's. Commissioner Hardy's. You may not be able to hear. Commissioner Hardy's, if you're uh, there, I'm asking you to unmute. Um, but perhaps walked away for a moment. Right. Okay. We'll go ahead and Commissioner Norton. Here. Commissioner Goon. Here. Commissioner Jacoby. Here. Commissioner Sibley. and Commissioner Hardy's. Right, I guess we'll note that Commissioner Hardy's appears to be on his way into the portal, but hasn't formally arrived. Um, all right, thank you. We do have a quorum. Um, first item on our agenda is approval of the meeting minutes from March 3rd. Uh, which were reasonably lengthy. Uh, any comments or uh, questions on the meeting minutes? Um, okay, uh, I only have one brief comment and somewhere in here, uh, it was noted uh, that I was trying to get the um, uh, historic preservation conference session that I attended on that uh, demolition uh, ordinance, um, kind of deconstruction ordinance shared. I, at the moment, all I can do is go back in and watch it uh, through my own login. So I've asked, uh, I sent a note to Historic Preservation uh, Inc. Uh, down in Denver to see if there's a way we can share that and package it to everyone. So I think that would be useful. Uh, so that's still in process. All right, uh, if there are no comments or corrections, I'll uh, entertain a motion. Um, I'll move to accept the minutes from April, um, from March of 2022. And I'll second them. Okay, thank you. I have a motion to approve the minutes from Commissioner Norton, seconded by Commissioner Goon. Um, and uh, Ms. Joseph, you would call the roll for us. Uh, Chairman Lane. Approved, yes. Try Commissioner Hardy's. Commissioner Norton. Uh, yes. Commissioner Goon. Yes, approved. Commissioner Jacoby. Approved. Commissioner Sibley. Approved. Okay, great, thanks. We have the unanimous approval of the March 3rd minutes. For the package. Uh, let's see. So then we have a report. Uh, let's see. Um, <clears throat> report from the chair. So this is again my opportunity to tell anyone out there uh, that we will have a uh, public invited to be heard and um, potentially public hearing during that time. Um, this will, information will pop up on your screen. And uh, you can call in using the number and the meeting ID um, at that time. And we'll call on you once we're back live. Uh, comments are limited to three minutes for these sessions. And uh, we do ask that you state your name and address for the record prior, prior to proceeding with your comments. And remember to mute the live stream so that we don't get nasty feedback. 
All right. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Next is communications from staff liaison. Um, Leonard Schumacher, do you have some information for us? Uh, well, actually, good before afternoon. Before you do that, let me just note. Uh, sorry, Brian. Uh, no, that's fine. Let me just, just note that um, uh, Commissioner Hardy's uh, has arrived. Yeah, sorry about that. My computer froze and we had to do some gymnastics. No, no worries. Welcome. We assume that we hope that you didn't have any objection to the meeting minutes because we approved them. Nope, that sounds good to me. <laughs> okay, great. Too late anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. All right, Ryan. All right. Well, I'll be brief uh, since most of the items that we're planning to talk about are covered on the agenda items. There's just one item that I was going to remind the commission of. And I think I sent a kind of a list of webinars that are hosted by History Colorado a little while, maybe last month. There's one coming up on April 20th of note, and I try to send out another email just with a reminder. It's regarding preservation loans. Uh, again, it's April 20th over the lunch hour. So I encourage uh, commissioners who are interested in that to, to participate. It's a good training session for, for everybody on the commission. So, and that's all I have for, for right now. Okay. Thanks, Brian. I, you you were busy last month. This is a this is a um, today the, the packet for today's meeting was um, one of those careful what you ask for kind of scenarios. <laughs> but, but I appreciate all the work you put in. Uh, sure. All right. Um, let's see. So this uh, now is our uh, public invited to be heard portion of the meeting. This would be for anything that is not on the agenda. If there's anyone out there that would like to comment. Um, to the commission. Again, for something not on the agenda, please go ahead and dial in now using the toll-free number, enter the meeting ID number and press pound. And then we will call on you based on your phone number to uh, uh, give you your three minutes. And uh, so at the moment, we'll take a five minute break while we wait to see if anyone calls in. Uh, and during that time, commissioners can mute and turn off their video feeds. Thanks.
chair. We are about 20 seconds out from the five minute mark. Currently, there are no callers. Okay, thanks. No problem. Once I see the commission returns, I will confirm if we have any more callers. All right. I do see that a caller did just join. So in that case, if you're ready, we can start this off. Okay. Uh, let's see. Commissioners, you want to uh, get back online here? I'm looking for Commissioner Norton. wait a couple seconds here to see if Commissioner Norton gets back with us before sure. we start with the public comment. Commissioner Norton, if you are there, um, but unable to turn on your cam or your mic, you can feel free to, to maybe close out of Zoom and then jump back on. Um, otherwise, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pinging to start video, but think there might be something on their end. Okay. okay. Well, uh, I guess we'll move forward with the... Uh... Uh, public invited to be heard portion of the meeting and hopefully Commissioner Norton can uh, either hear us or get back in uh, to the meeting. So um, again, uh... Sure. Yes, yeah, in that I case, can I can start with our caller. Caller with the last three digits, 414, caller 414. If you are there, please mute your live stream and hit star six to unmute your device. Caller with the last three digits of their phone number, 414. Please hit star six to unmute. Oh, I, I saw you unmute and then go back to mute. Uh, try one more time hitting star six. Hi there. Can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yes. All righty. Do I begin? I don't see anyone on screen. <laughs> uh, yes. If you would uh, please state your name and address, and then uh, you have three minutes uh, for comments to the commission. Welcome and thank you. Okay, thank you, Commission. Um, this is Sharon O'Leary, 534 Emory Street, co-chair of Historic Eastside Neighborhood. Uh, Historic Preservation Commission, we're now moving into the second quarter of 2022. And where are you? And where are we headed? Where are you headed? Um, have you developed a work plan which you can move forward on for Longmont? Um, have you looked into updating the demolition code? Could you make motions so that items move to the next level? As I've attended these meetings the last two years, um, motions aren't made. And to me, when I've served on boards, once a motion is made, seconded, and then there's discussion, typically that gets it moving along. So um, may I suggest that as um, commission members that you make motions to move things forward. So it does get on a timeline. Um, I know that um, right now, as we enter the second um, quarter of the year, we're supposed to be getting the status on planning 
and creating guidelines for preservation. Where are we with that? I mean, I know it's just the beginning of the second quarter, but uh, the wheels of bureaucracy move very slowly. Um, so I just want to give you a little background knowledge um, as far as preservation. The historic West Side's already been partially dismantled just due to the past 30 years of their zoning being significantly different than that of the historic East Side. And there are some people who live there that want to capitalize on their present zoning, um, and they've lived there for a long time. The West Side has less concerns or problems for the last 30 years because of their present zoning. Um, they have, they do have the benefit of not living so close to the train and they don't have very large multifamily complexes and they have not had a school demolished like we had the Bryant school demolished at Longs Peak and Emory. And there's uh, no East West street closures. So life and property values are good over there. Um, then there's Denver who only recently came under the pres preservation umbrella. And I would guess it was for financial benefit. I'm talking about our downtown. I'm sorry, not Denver downtown. There are many owners who maybe don't want you to tell them what to do. And then maybe other people, it is their belief system and financial gain. So back to Henna. We just want what we had before you changed our zoning from RLE. Exploitation has started. We want to remain historically sensitive neighborhood with livable space. And if someone wants an AUD, then it must follow the historic sensitive guidelines. We do not want to get our protect, we, if we do not get our protections back, we will be exploited with ADUs because there's space for it. And most likely they won't be affordable by the time they're built out. So what I'm asking is we've been good guardians and we'd like to continue. And one side of guidelines is not going to be good for all. So as a historic preservation commission, please make some motions, move things forward, ask questions. And the, demolished co the demolition code, I just want to say, 830 was demolished because it said it couldn't support a second story. I think that was an error on Jade's part, uh, something that maybe you might want to investigate to see if I'm off base or if Jade was off base. So um, please hurry up. Thank you. I appreciate your time and dedication. Thank you for your comments. All right. That was the only caller we had. Was that correct? That is correct. Okay. We'll go ahead and close the public invited to be heard portion of our hearing and move on to the next item, which is prior business. Uh, before we get into it, I just wanted to double check um this is an action requested uh item so do we have a public hearing portion uh of this item sorry commissioners took me a little while to get unmuted um no we do not uh this is not a uh a formal hearing item that requires a public hearing uh it's basically a recommendation from the commission on the uh, condition of approval that was approved by both Planning Zoning Commission and City Council. Okay, great, thanks. I just wanted to make sure that I didn't miss something because sometimes I get a little uh, eager to move things along and sure. get that portion, which is bad. So, all right. Um, well, uh, Brian, do you want to give us just a quick overview? I mean, I think we're all familiar with this, but uh, in terms of what we're, what we're here again to, to talk about? Sure, and uh, we have several guests, and I think they were uh, introduced as kind of the, the beginning of the meeting before we started the recording, but there's representatives from the uh, property ownership group, uh, United Properties, uh, Jamie Pollock and Mona Dilliard are here this evening. I think somebody perhaps from Dimension Group was gonna join us. I'm not sure if they're able or on the call or not. They're part of the design group for the project. Um, and, um, Included in your packet was some background information regarding uh, conversations that the commission had on this topic. I believe you discussed this uh, with Jade and the uh, applicants, uh, at least on a couple of instances. Uh, I think it started uh, actually in 2020 and continued a couple of meetings in 2021 as well. And it culminated, I believe, in a uh, recommendation from the commission in September 21. And 
I think in the packet there's copies of those meeting minutes uh, regarding that particular discussion. Um, and at the time, the commission had recommended that the, uh, the project, the 7-Eleven proposal, the commercial center not move forward because of the significance of the property under the four criteria, making it eligible on the national register. So you, the commission's recommendation was forwarded on to the Plan Zoning Commission uh, when they uh, held their public hearing on the uh, rezoning and the overall development plan for the proposal. And as part of that hearing, uh, as noted in the, in the communication, the, uh, the Plan Zoning Commission included a condition of approval to develop a plan for preservation of the site's history through incorporation of appropriate references to be included with the development of the site. And so that was to be implemented in coordinates with HBC, and that's why we're here this evening, as well as city staff. Uh, the commission's recommendation was forwarded on to city council uh, as part of their deliberation on the item uh, this past winter. I mean, I think it happened in January and February when the uh, hearings were heard with city council. And I just will also note that uh, the Historic Preservation Commission's recommendation was also included in the information that was forwarded on to city council as well. So they were aware of the uh, recommendation that was made by not only Plan Zoning Commission, but also the Historic Preservation Commission. And the, uh, the city council did approve in February the rezoning and the overall development plan to allow the, the 7-Eleven Zlaten Commercial Center to move forward. Um, with the, with the condition that was uh, brought forth by the Plan Zoning Commission regarding developing a plan as noted in the communication. And so we're here this evening just to kind of talk about that. I know there's, like I said, there's representative from the ownership here to uh, at, respond to any questions the commission might have uh, as noted. And Dallas, if you wouldn't mind maybe putting up those, uh, those slides that were in the packet, that might be helpful just for reference. Sure thing. Give me just a moment. Thank you very much. And then in terms of uh, those who are here uh, representing the uh, owners, um, do you have anything you'd like to present or talk about uh, to the commission? If you want to walk us through some ideas or we're, you're certainly welcome. Okay. Yeah, hi, this is uh, Jamie Pollock with United Properties. Um, we're the developer on this project. Um, I know that uh, our architect was actually, sorry, I'm starting my video. Sorry, Dallas. Um, our architect was supposed to be on to answer a little bit more, but um, yeah, so I think over time, we've kind of played around with some different stuff. We've done some structural integrity um, studies on, on the buildings and, and the barns and whatnot. And um, those did not come back very favorable. We um, also were worried about some of the riffraff that those structures were bringing to the property and whatnot, but uh, very respectful to the history and want to do something here. Um, and I think we kind of came up with a few different ideas here to throw out to you guys um, in regards to, you know, how we could maybe show, you know, the history there. And is there, I think is the next slide showing one of them. So this is just the project, um, where the project lays there on 119th and Slayton. And then if you could keep going, um, to the next slide. And if I could maybe just, sorry, Jamie, for, for interrupting, if I could just interject, I know that yeah. there is a note on here about the, uh, the floodplain, and there is a local floodplain. Uh, it's not a FEMA recognized floodplain. So, um, you know, in terms of the process, there'd still be a process in terms of reviewing any modifications to the barn, um, but it wouldn't have necessarily have to go through FEMA. So, FEMA. so that, I just wanted to clarify that because I talked to our floodplain administrator today about that. Good. 
Thanks, Brian. Um, so that, yeah, so he, I guess Brian hit on the floodplain. Can you go to the next slide, please? Let's see here. Again, I think this is slide here is just showing those existing buildings and the condition of those buildings um, as we walk through them. And uh, again, a little bit, you know, of our concerns with the structural integrity there, I think there was a whole lot of money to restore those buildings. I think if we keep going, we can get to the slides that show what we were proposing for. I think this is the start. Yeah. Okay. okay, this is the start of it. Okay. All right. So I, I think one of the, the ideas here was to do some kind of um, concrete patches to show where where the buildings were. Um, there was just a different ar architectural idea from our architect um, to kind of, you know, it, within the paving show where those buildings were. To basically make it like a different color. Yeah, so in the, in the, I think the proposal as I'm reading it, in the area where there's pavement, there's a, uh, a different uh, contrasting material, perhaps, or color to align the location of the structures that are, are being removed in those particular locations. And then for the other buildings that are kind of outside of the construction footprint, such as the barn and a couple of the other outbuildings, that I think the proposal was to do a, a maybe a couple foot tall uh, kind of concrete foundation to show where the uh, the buildings uh, resided. Correct. I think um, can you move to the next slide there. So this shows that a little bit different for, for everybody there. Just some ideas on how that that would show. Okay, uh, I see uh, Commissioner Norton has got her hand raised. Uh, did you have a question about that specifically you wanted to? Yeah, I have several questions about this. Um, okay. First of all- About this particular, I, I wanna make sure- Yeah, about, about the concrete. Okay. Specifically. Okay. Um, I'm sure I'll have questions about all of the, the proposals. Um, I think, you know, one of my first questions is really about how, so thinking about how a convenience store like this, what kind of traffic and how people use it, um, you know, how would people be directed out to the concrete pad structures that are outside of that parking area? What is the plan for long-term maintenance of that? Like, what does that look like with the longevity of the concrete? And then this site, one of the criteria under which it is eligible is D, which is an archeological criteria because of the data potential. Um, how are you going to avoid and or take into consideration the archeological assemblages if you're adding structures essentially uh, and doing subsurface disturbance out in these areas. Uh, again, my my architect is not here. Uh, yeah. supposed to call, call I, well, on some of this though, like as far as I know, the structures that are out in the grass area. Um sorry, I will start my video. There we go. Am I good? Um, so as far as the structures in the grass area, um, we weren't looking to have people come, um, out to those structures. We would actually prefer that that not be the case. Then what is the utility and how are we, uh, educating the public about the history of the site through these structures? Um, well... On one of our future slides, we were proposing um, to do more of an information panel on uh, the trail that's going to be in that Greenway Trail. Um, so we were proposing that with information and we had also talked with Brian about uh, even putting some kind of, you know, if some kind of monument or something that 
uh, offered some information. We've talked, I think as far as information giving um, the public, it goes into probably more on the rest of our presentation here, but um, our architect was also looking right. at doing something on the screens inside the store, on the monitors, the TV monitors that give info. Um, so we were, yes. we're just kind of looking for your guys's ideas and suggestions on that. Um, we were just throwing out a variety of ideas. So I'm asking specifically on this idea, just on number mm -hmm. one for installing custom concrete outlines depicting the existing foundation locations. What is the utility if we don't intend having the public actually see and visit those? Show where the barn was. But if you don't want the public out there, how are they going to see where the barn was? Well, it would be a raised surface so that they could see it from the paved area. I think it might be helpful to, to let um, you guys run through the rest of the ideas and then maybe we um, continue the discussion. Yeah, and, and I think, again, this is a, an open discussion. Um, you know, we, we want the input from you guys. We just came up with alternatives. We wanted you to know that we were thinking about it and we're open to suggestions from, from there. So next, next slide. So we did, we discussed, uh, you know, putting a, mur a mural on the building, uh, something that we have done in some other locations of ours um, around in different cities and whatnot. Um, and so we had just kind of, it's something that would be painted more or less on the side of the, the building there. Um, and we just put those pictures below, like, you know, basically showing the representation of the barns and whatnot. So that was just a different, different idea. Uh, next one. And I think right there is kind of showing the location we were thinking about that mural um, on the side of the building there. So be the west elevation facing west there. So everybody who's coming in and turning into the, the project would be able to see it on the building. Uh, next slide. So this is what Mona was talking about a little bit there about the TVs that would could be mounted within in the store that, um, you know, basically would be more or less a rotating video of different pictures. And um, if people are visiting the store, they would see the historic meaning of, of the site there. Just so just a different idea of things that have been done in the past. Is that click on the right there, the video, is there, a, is that, does that take you somewhere? Um, it looks like it. I can mess around with it, but I didn't realize there was a video attached. So if it is something that needs downloaded, that'll take a second. Mona, is there a video on there? Um, I, t I don't know that. Um, I don't know. Yeah, there, there's a video link embedded in there. Um, Dallas, I don't know if you can have access to that or it's a couple minute video and I don't know if any of the other the commissioners were able to access that online. Um, I also, I also I, have I, it. it wouldn't work. So Yeah, I do. Yeah, there's a link that, um, or sorry, there's a, I do not have permission to open the video link. If, if, if the commission is interested in seeing it, I have it on my screen. If I could should perhaps share my screen, if there's any interest in seeing that. Yeah, let's do that if we can. Dallas, is it okay if I share my screen? Go ahead, yeah. Assuming I get the right one. Can you see a blank screen on that? Yeah. Yep. 
All right, let me see if this works. Brian, if there's audio attached to it, um, we're hearing it through your speakers and not through the actual video. So I paused it, Dallas. I don't know how to connect it to, to the audio. Okay. Um, if you close it real quick, the next time you offer to share your screen, it should allow you to, it'll, there'll be a button at the bottom that says optimize for audio and vis video. All it is is music anyways. I don't know if that makes a difference. I don't, I don't know if the music's that important. Dallas. Yeah. Okay. So I'll try this again. Restart this. Not restart it, but continue from where I left off. All right, I think that's it. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, and I think that was, you know, just an idea of different things we could put up on those monitors to show the history and, and what existed there at one point. So again, just throwing out ideas and thoughts. And, and Dallas, okay, thank you. You gotta put the slides back up, thank you. Maybe continue on to yeah. the the so we did we uh, I, Mona had mentioned we talked about the reader board along the, the greenway there um, there's there's also the idea of putting another reader um, one on that greenway and also a reader on the back side of the development there you know maybe there's a little um, paved area that you could put it on with a bench or something that people could come and and look and see that the reader and the history of the site there. And I, I think as notes on the side there, but we um, we are making a contribution through the development um, of 140,000 towards the Greenway improvements. So I think that would be part of that. Next slide. So again, that's showing that reader board in the backside of the property there um, where we could do a little, you know, a landscaped area 
um, that, that people could visit to see the history of it. Next slide. believe that is all I've got. It, it might have been it, yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, I guess I have, I have one quick question for you. Uh, in your mind, um, is this something where you may be willing to do more than one of these, or is this an either or uh, kind of scenario from your perspective? What's, what's your approach here? Yeah, I think we're kind of just open to, to feedback here and what, what you guys are looking for. Um, yeah, we're open to discussion, obviously financial impact um, affects the feasibility of the project, but I don't think we're talking about anything real crazy here, so. Okay, uh, other commissioners have uh, questions or comments you'd like to put out there? Yeah, Commissioner Jacoby. There we go. Can you, you can hear me. Um, I, I like the idea of the mural. Um, a TV monitor maybe showing videos would maybe be nice as well, but I, I don't think we have to show collapsed buildings. I think you could show a lot more of the agrarian side of what some of what it looked like before. Um, I'm a little, I, I'd like clarification on no improvements may be allowed in a floodplain. I'm looking at that barn and it's outside of your development, proposed development. The ridge line is arrow straight. It looks structurally sound. I realize it doesn't meet code and to meet code would be expensive and unfeasible since it's in the floodplain. Although it looks like it's the same elevation as the house and where you plan to develop, it's very close. Um, certainly the barn has stood for over a hundred years. Um, I think it's pretty safe. Um, Without doing improvements, just preservation of the barn, I think would be feasible and maybe uh, more appropriate. What uh, would be more dramatic for individuals coming to see the history of the property? And I wonder if you considered that. So I, I'd like, I'd love to see the barn preserved, uh, maybe with a plaque out there. That would give it, and it has some, again, floodplains, open space around that. That would give more a feeling of the barn and the farm. I think, than outlines in the pavement. And I wonder if that would be something feasible, something you could think about. Well, a, a couple, couple inputs there. Um, there are a couple of things. First of all, the, there's been the riffraff that's been kind of hanging around those barns and whatnot. So, um, you know, that that's one thing. And then the other is being that there is some structural integrity issues there it's it becomes a liability for the property owner um that you know really falls on on them so on, on us so those are some of the considerations we've had within that i i can speak a little bit to again you talk about the riffraff um appropriate use discourages inappropriate use i've seen that in some local parks here um and I think you would see the same thing with a barn. I don't think you would have riffraff nearly as much of a problem with uh, riffraff when you have traffic going in and out of a 7-Eleven all the time. Uh, also, I think, again, when I look at that barn, the doors are open, the windows are open, simply putting locks on the doors and, and locking the doors and maintaining that, it sounds like a minimal uh, input that would have quite a bit of safety associated with it. I think that's something you could consider. I know that, I don't know that it's the barn in particular, but one of the structures has been boarded up and um, the boarded up windows have been removed and there were um, individuals living in there, the barn and, and the other um, shelter there has, you know, drug paraphernalia, alcohol, that kind of stuff. So, I mean, there is, it has, like I said, I, I can't speak hundred percent on if the barn is boarded up. I thought that everything was, um, but there has been problems with people removing 
uh, the boards and still getting in there. I don't know the property like you folks do, but when I drive by, the house is boarded up, but the doors are open to the barn. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I can't speak on that. Um, uh, so I, I don't know for sure, but I know when we had um, some of our environmental work out there done, they were a little nervous about it with because um, someone had been living in there on it, where it was boarded up. Uh, Commissioner Hardy's. I just wanted to uh, uh, agree with Commissioner Jacoby that you know, when a property is stabilized and it can be secured and it's in a supervised area, uh, it, those kinds of abuses normally go away. I've, I've never worked on, I shouldn't say never, most of the historic properties I've worked on in rehab and preservation did not meet code and did not, you know, would never have passed current structural uh, load uh, calculations. They all require some work to stabilize them. So I don't, I don't think that's a, a good enough excuse not, not to uh, put some effort into saving the barn. I'd rather we, take that save than all the other measures we did, I know, um, we did have somebody, per, uh, a structural engineer go out there and I believe all of that's been provided as far as um, what, what it would take to um, make those safe structures. Oh, I wasn't implying that it's easy. I'm just saying that it, it is done all the time. And gotcha. I've done projects myself where we did that um, and totally, replaced structure where necessary or supplemented it with new new structure to you know reach the load requirements uh, the one view on the inside of that barn tells me that there's ample opportunity to to add uh, you know the, the kind of bracing and and you know cable ties or whatever might be needed to fully stabilize uh, the structure uh, there's some cost involved for sure, but uh, I'm, ju I'm just saying that I, I think that that would be a much stronger statement of the historic character of the site than all of the concrete paving and, and raised you know, concrete foundation you know, walls and, and plaques that are proposed in, in the other schemes, in my opinion. Commissioner Jacoby. And I, maybe I missed it, but in the previous discussion, what I saw was the discussion of bringing the barn and the other structures up to code and that that was economically not feasible. But right. we're not talking about bringing it up to code. We're talking about just what structural needs does it have? And I, I don't recall seeing any uh, assessment of just the, the, the required structural needs to maintain the barn as it is. Okay. Yeah, I don't think we provided any cost as far as that goes. It was more so to bring it up to code. Right. Yeah. Uh, Brian, do you have, I know back in that September meeting, we did have, we were given a copy of the structural evaluation, which I don't know that we have available right now. I don't know if that's something that could be brought up and, and shout out to everybody or put up on the screen specific to the barn. Um, but, but, yeah, let me I mean, see what uh, I can track down while you guys are chatting. Okay, but but right, I mean there is a there is a a step of just pure stabilization, right? Um, that, that is a potential. Uh, other and then, and then you know they still sit in that floodplain, so we you know there there is that problem going forward as it as it is, and I think bring bringing up again the liability that then lands on the, the property owner, um, you know, it's, it's a significant little risk or impact that we have to worry about, right? Someone goes out, plays around in the barn, tries to get in, whatever, something happens and, uh, you know, that, that falls on the property owner. Again, I think appropriate use discourages inappropriate use. If you plan to have a very busy 7-Eleven and gas station and restaurant there, 
with with eyes on that property all the time, I don't think people will be trying to break in actively. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe at two in the morning, the traffic will be light enough that someone will try to do that, but it seems relatively unlikely to me. And again, the floodplain, it, it may technically be in the floodplain, but that building's been standing for over a hundred years. That has a straighter roof line, straighter roof line than some of the houses in my neighborhood here. I live in the historic district. Um, I think it's held up quite well. I don't see that floodplain, frankly, being pr practically a, a large issue. Well, uh, it, yeah. it does sit on the. It sits on the greenway, so you know. I think that's where you know some of that might drift in, and um, it, it is going to be a building out there by itself. I, I don't know. I, I do worry. I I still worry about it. <laughs> so uh, I would. Sorry. Uh, Commissioner, right. just one second, and I'll, and I'll get, okay. give you the floor. Um, can can staff speak to any potential issue with that being just stabilized in the floodplain? Would that present a problem on its, you know, by itself or not? Yeah, I, I mean, I can talk briefly about it. Obviously, I'm not a floodplain administrator, but I did speak with Monica Bordellini, who is our floodplain administrator. And as I mentioned earlier in the discussion, it is not a FEMA mapped floodplain, it's a local floodplain. So there's more discretion in terms of what the city can or cannot require uh, in terms of uh, requirements. Um, I think if, if the intent was to do substantial changes to the structure, then most likely or might need to be ra are raised out of the floodplain, but if it's just stabilizing, I'm guessing that it probably wouldn't need to be brought up out of the floodplain. Okay, thanks. So uh, I was able to find the uh, structural assessment from the September meeting. Um, and it looked like, I, I don't know, I can bring it up on the screen if you want, but it just uh, said in summary, an appropriate budget to upgrade the structure just from a stabilization standpoint, is seventy-five to one hundred thousand dollars, and that's specific to the barn. That's yes. just the one barn. Yeah, right. That's just the barn. I'm just kind of scrolling through here because I didn't participate in that meeting, so I'm just kind right. of you know. right. And it would be worth seeing if you if that talks about upgrading two two existing structural loads, right? So if, if you take an old structure and you have to make it meet minimum standards that we have today, that can be quite a bit more expensive than just pure stabilization, um, in which case, you know, those snow loads and so on don't, wind loads are not met, but with a historic structure, it's simply stabilized. So that is a little different, but but uh, I appreciate you digging in. If you can, if, if anything else crops up, let us know. In the meantime, I'll give uh, Commissioner Norton the floor. Thank you. Um, you know, I just wanted to kind of go back and revisit the significance of the property um, and remind the, the landowner of what we mean when we're asking for um, mitigations for historic preservation. Um, so even here in um, Brian's, fantastic memo that is in our packet tonight. You know, it says because the property is significant under all four criteria, it's eligible for the National Register. You only need to be eligible under one criteria to be listed on the National Register. Um, and I think I've, I've stated in previous meetings um, that in my professional career, I have almost never seen a property that is significant under all four criteria. So this is an incredibly important property to Longmont into telling our history. So any mitigation measures that um, the city agrees to should really be in line and scope with that significance. Um, that's one of the reasons that I, I was puzzled and concerned with the, with the first stipulation identifying, you know, installing these funky little concrete outlines that exist, you know, uh, that identify existing foundation locations. Um, I feel like maybe 
I, I recognize that you all have been thinking about this and I appreciate that. Um, I wonder if these have been in discussion with historic preservation professionals, um, because I think that there are some significant issues. Um, and I think that with some of these uh, proposals that might not actually meet historic preservation ideals for preserving important places and important history. Um, and I, I really urge you to think about why we're asking for the barn to be saved in this instance and why that is so important to a historic preservation commission for telling the history of Longmont. So I, I agree with my fellow commissioners that that is the ideal for this because we will be losing so much of early Longmont with this development of a 7-Eleven. Thanks, Commissioner Norton. Other commissioner comments? Commissioner Jacoby? Um, again, I don't know how much you've pursued the historical aspect as well. I get the sense that you, uh, in developing this property, this has been seen as more of a road bump than an interesting avenue to explore. But if it, again, it may cost $100,000 to stabilize the facility, but the state historical fund can provide up to $50,000 for rehabilitation expenses if, it, if it's approved. And again, if you pursued historic designation for the barn. Um, you could get funds perhaps from his the state historical fund, state tax credits of up 20% uh, to 35% for repairs. It, you know, there, the system is in place to try to make this easy for you to meet the needs that we see here as a historical commission. Thanks. Um, a couple of my comments. I, I actually thought the um, the notion of um, the concrete patterning of the structures that were removed was a was, was a pretty interesting approach. Um, so I didn't have as much of a of an issue with it. Understanding that we're not in that particular case getting um, true preservation, that we're at least getting some sort of uh, hint of uh, hint of history there. I, I didn't mind that. I thought that was an interesting way to, um, to approach it. I don't particularly like the mural idea, uh, but, I, but I could see, you know, some combination of that concrete patterning and a video or, or signage or something. Um, and if that barn wasn't sitting out there in a, in a, you know, the barn is a bit of an issue because it, it's it, everything else in order to do your project needs to get done. I mean, those those other structures have to go away and they're in pretty poor shape and I get it. Um, but it's pretty hard to say, you know, gosh, yeah, for I mean, if it's seventy five thousand to bring the building up to code, it's probably less than that to stabilize. If it's fifty thousand dollars to stabilize it and you could get a grant from the state historic fund for the $50,000 to stabilize it, um, you know, it, it's a hard sell for us as a commission to say, well, yeah, we'll, we'll just let that go uh, because it doesn't, it just doesn't seem to be a reason other than a reluctance and potential, I get the potential insurance risk, right? Other than that, financially, I'm not even sure there is a risk. So that's, it's, it's a pretty hard sell, I think, here. Uh, I, I do appreciate the, the, the thought that went into it. And I think you've got some creative ideas for the rest of it, but that's a hard one for me. Uh, uh, Brian, you've got your hand up. Sorry, I was muted. Um, when I was talking before, um, yeah, this is a very large file for whatever reasons. And it was kind of messing up on the screen when I was talking to the commission before. So I'm not sure if I gave you the full flavor in terms of the, the cost estimate that was provided by in this assessment anyway. Um, so maybe if I, and I can't really share that with you because it's such a large document. Uh, I'm happy to uh, 
put it up on the screen if I can. So bear with me. And I think our architect is trying to join as well, which can also um, provide more info on what they've done to when they went out there and did the structural assessment. So can you all see that on the screen? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so there's different aspects and I don't know which components, obviously the architects on the commission can certainly provide more feedback regarding this assessment. And I, I'm assuming you had an opportunity to take a look at it at the, uh, the meeting in, in September. There's a discussion, and I'm sorry, I can certainly zoom in on, on the screen a little bit. There's a discussion about the different components of this building, and one was related to the, the roof, um, and it talked about some potential repairs, and I don't know if it's just to stabilize it or if it's just for additional upgrades that would be needed to make it habitable. Uh, but anyway, uh, I'm not going to read through this, but they, they provided a budget to upgrade the roof of approximately $200,000. I'm, I'm not an architect. I don't know what's all involved with that. If that's, in fact, just for stabilization or if it's for code upgrades or whatever that might be. Um, and then moving on to the next page, there's... Uh, talk about uh, some posts that are into the foundation, into the ground uh, that would need to be uh, analyzed in terms of their load capacity. And I think that's where I saw the $75,000 to $100,000 to upgrade the structure. I mean, that's what the, the, those uh, posts that are providing support for the barn uh, that's what that assessment evaluation is about. And then, and then uh, it's about uh, repairs needed to the, the walls um, and the number that's associated with that was $300,000. Whether that's accurate or not, I, I don't know. Um, and then um, there was some additional second floor images. I think this is a second floor. I think their assessment was that it was second floor of the barn was in pretty good shape. Uh, some, they thought some of the beams might be, were installed in size correctly. So that's one good thing. Uh, they, they put an assessment of $50,000 for some repairs that might be needed on the second floor. And then the foundation, they showed some images of uh, some cracking in the foundation. I don't know if that's substantial or not. Uh, so I, I apologize for my previous comment. They said that the overall, I mean, the, the foundation repairs would be $300,000. Again, I don't know if that's, again, stabilization or bringing it up to code. They're, their preliminary total repair budget to upgrade this structure would be in excess of $1 million. And then bring it up and make it habitable would be $2 million. So. All right, thanks, thanks, Brian. Uh, if there's anything else on that document you wanna see, let me know. There's also assessments related to some of the other structures as well. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Norton, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I I think what's missing from this conversation about how much it would cost this for-profit company is what this overall project is costing and what the percentage of uh, stabilization of this one structure would be in relationship to that. that. That is numbers that I have not seen presented at any point in these conversations. Um, but also, I'm, I don't have a lot of sympathy for um, discussing the budget for, for 7-Eleven and considering the historic preservation um, 
in in terms of of that. I'm sure that you will make plenty of money in the times that this 7-Eleven and Laredo Taco are in existence um, on the backs of the loss of our history. Um, I'll say, uh, oh, Commissioner Goon, you had a question, go ahead. Well, I, I would just say that was pretty harsh. Um, it is a lot of money and the backs of our history is disappearing every day that that place sits empty. Um, so that is already happening and it's been happening for the last, I think it was 10 years that that place has been empty and no one has been wanting to purchase it. So I do, I, I, I would ask, it sounds like, I mean, what you were reading, Brian, um, said it was to bring it all to commercial space. So that, that was the very first uh, paragraph that you were showing on that very first page. It said it was to bring it to commercial space. So I, I am curious, I mean, it, if it's, you know, under a, a few hundred thousand and not into the millions, it, it does seem like that may, that's worth preserving, especially with the help that you can get other places. And I recognize that grants and delays and everything else, it's that all costs money and, um, you know, it, 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 all of that stuff costs money as well. And we've, you've already been delayed on this because of, you know, all of the rigmarole is going through, but it's all part of this major piece of Longmont's history that, um, you know, maybe, maybe it wasn't taken as seriously as we might've wanted to at the very beginning when you first purchased the place and you didn't realize how deep of a piece of history that is. So it, it, I think it would be helpful to, to, to get an idea of how that barn could be preserved in a manner that isn't, you know, isn't costing two million, but at least could stand there. And, and you know, what is the difference in your liability between this insurance and this insurance? That would be worth knowing when you're going forward. Um, and if, if you need our approval, it sounds like it's past planning and zoning already. It sounds like the city of Longmont has no interest in it, which is, odd to me, maybe they, they could even subsidize some of that insurance as far as that's concerned, but there's other ideas out there um, that, you know, maybe taken more seriously than, than a mural. And I love to read um, the plaques on walks, but it, it doesn't reconstruct. Um, so when you, when you do lose a big barn like that, it, that's kind of major. And, but we are losing it every day that passes without anything happening. So there's that. Thank you, Commissioner Goon. Uh, Commissioner Sibley. On the mute, sorry. Um, I, you guys have spoken beautifully about the barn, so I have nothing to add to that. Um, the, the smaller structures that we've got the outlines for, um, I think that's, an interesting idea, um, especially in the parking lot and whatnot, and combined with the signage, I think that's great. Um, the buildings that are in the grass area, though, um, just an idea. Instead, if instead of concrete, what about doing some sort of shadow line building, or or not building, but like you know the outline of it, or somehow doing roofing, even if it was like play slash picnic area, something like that. Um, just food for thought, basically. Um, just kind of taking your idea and maybe doing something else with, with those structures anyway. So, so that, that's it I've got. Thank you. Uh, I do think that um, based on experience that, I, that I've had working with um, historic buildings uh, as an architect, um, that, that that two million or three million number is pretty pretty inflated in terms of what it would take to for stabilization. Because um, again, if you're if you're purely stabilizing, you could really take a decent look at the foundations. My guess, I don't, you know, it's hard to tell from a few pictures, but my guess is again, very often these buildings have been there for a very long time. If they're not, if they're not literally falling down, um, then they're probably reasonably stable. 
Um, you, if you're not using the space inside, it could be stabilized with some pretty rough methods, which would be not particularly cost costly. So I think there would be an opportunity to to stabilize that and you know repaint and and just have that uh, structure out there. So um, I, I guess one thing to to ask is 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 there any scenario under which you would uh, uh, accept or entertain um, such a condition you know i i think again it, it's just in being in real estate and a property owner i think um all that and by by the way i, I think someone was mentioned we we don't actually own the property yet um we're just a developer going through planning to do this so um but we um you know there's the liability there's also the ongoing maintenance of such i mean we could get it to a certain condition and then you also have that piece of it um i'm wondering you know if if there was the way to dedicate these buildings to the city and it, that liability falls towards the municipality or whatever it might be but i, I think there's different things that could be talked about i guess there Um, Brian, I'm wondering, uh, you know, it feels like obviously the commission's pretty, um, pretty adamant about the barn. If we were to make, um, a recommendation to, uh, approve provided that they stabilized the barn and kept that on the property, um, that goes as a recommendation what what happens from there you know it goes to does it go back to planning is this just your, your, or p and z is this just going to city council to both do they take our consideration and maybe if they don't like it the pick from some of the i'm just trying to wonder you know a what's our is, is it worth giving them a preferred and a secondary option what's the process from here well, great question, Commissioner Lane. <laughs> you know, I think uh, depending upon the, the commission's recommendation, uh, you know, I'd have to talk with our staff and maybe legal and, and then uh, it, it may end up, since council was the ultimate decision-making body uh, on the uh, approval of the rezoning and the overall development plan, I suspect it would probably uh, end up unless the the uh, property owner and applicant agreed to the recommendation from the commission. I suspect it would probably end up going back to the council for a final determination. Okay, um, and just to put it out there, I mean, my my personal preference would be that there's a way to stabilize the barn. However, if if that was the sole commission recommendation and it got ignored at the end and nothing happened, I think that would be worse. Um, and so I'd be inclined to consider a backup plan at the risk of understanding that that might undermine the former. It's a, it's a tough um, position to be in, but um, if there were a backup plan in my mind, it might look something like uh, asking for the, um, the the outlines. The I, I don't particularly uh, love the mural, but uh, the video and or plaques, uh, and then at an absolute minimum, a deconstruction and salvage of the barn materials, just for discussion. Any comments, uh, Commissioner uh, Commissioner Goon? Uh, well, I have a question. The 141,000 uh, donation to the Greenway, is that part of what you had to agree to to get planning and zoning to pass it? Because maybe there could be some negotiation in there. You know, you stabilize the barn, give it to the Greenway, and, and then the city covers the any liability or something on there you know something along those lines so That's commissioner sorry continue i didn't mean to interrupt no i was i was done 
Okay, I, I think my understanding is that the, uh, the $141,000 payment to the city is actually a payment in lieu for future improvements for greenway improvements. And I do not believe that it's related to the historic preservation. But is it a requirement to get the zoning redone for this project? So that would be a stipulation of in full entitlements of the, of the project uh, is that the uh, developer would be responsible for paying the $141,000. It's kind of like a cash out instead of them constructing the greenway improvements, the city will construct those greenway improvements in the future. And that's what the cost to the developer is. And greenway improvements are required. Yes, that's a requirement. See, to me, the, the city needs different priorities here. The Greenway versus this historic site and where, where it should be looking at its money. And I'm not sure how to fight that. I don't, I don't even know, you know, there's so many different pieces, all of them separated and making decisions on something like this. Um, if we could get the city to recognize that, that how, his, how great of a historic place this is, um, we have the write-up of it. Maybe sending that is Aaron Rodriguez around. Can he deliver that to the city council? And I, you know, I, I'm not even sure what the steps are here. Um, Sharon's always wanting us to do something, and this is partly why I, I, we're all separated. I, I, what do we do? Well, I suspect, and like I said, we'd have to have additional conversation. I say by we staff, additional conversations after we hear what the recommendation is from the commission. Um, if we end up going back to city council uh, with a recommendation from the commission that the property owner developer object to, then, you know, we would present that information in terms of the, you know, the fact that the property is eligible for designation on the national register. I think that was noted in the council communication. I'm not sure if the, the full report was presented to the council uh, as part of the packet of materials, but uh, I suspect that we'd want to provide that information if in fact the commission recommended that the, the barn remained and the, uh, like I said, the, uh, the, the owner and developer did not agree to that, that recommendation. Commissioner Jacoby. Um, another thought, again, the city is not interested in the property. Again, when you look at the details of that, when I spoke to Mr. Bell, the director of parks and open space, he was only peripherally aware of the, the property's historic value. When I discussed it with him, he was, he sounded quite interested. And then he dropped it like a lead weight when he heard it would cost millions of dollars, literally to upgrade the property. What he, he did not go into the detail that we're going to hear about preservation versus upgrading and improving the property. And he was, we were looking at that time at the whole property as opposed to just the barn. Perhaps it may be beneficial to reapproach uh, parks and open space and say, would you want to take over maintenance of the barn alone um, or take the property on or just take the maintenance of the, of the barn alone on for historic purposes. I mean, I, maintenance, again, Mr. Pollock, you mentioned that you're concerned about that. If we're not using the interior of the barn, maintenance is ma putting a good roof on it and keeping the paint on it. Um, there's, again, the ongoing maintenance. Um, the cost, his concern and your concern, I imagine, is again, how much is, is this going to be a money pit? I think that the cost of maintain, of structurally maintaining it should be reasonable, but we don't know that cost. Again, uh, we just, Brian, you went through some of the numbers, but again, you weren't sure if that was for improvements, bringing up to code, or is that just maintenance? My impression was that was to bring it up to code. We don't even have good numbers and it would really help me to know what we should do 
if we had good numbers for from someone who is experienced in preservation, just look not just an engineer looking at upgrading, but someone experienced in preservation, what would it cost to just structurally maintain this place? I think that would help all of us to move forward here. Other commissioners, Ter uh, Commissioner Goon, do you still have your hand up? Oh, or oh no, that was that okay. was an old. Yeah. Okay. So I I haven't had the opportunity to speak with uh, David Bell, who's the uh, director of natural resources. I think that's not his official title. Generally, that's correct. Um, and Glenn, I don't know if you're listening. If you're able, to, if you had a chance to talk with David at all about uh, the barn. Um, briefly, and I think his concerns are a lot of what we're hearing from the developer. Um, it's, we don't have a use for it and it's, uh, a, a bit of a liability and there's ongoing maintenance, but, um, we didn't get into, you know, the real dollars to keep it from falling down, um, or in, in a whole lot of detail, but. Yeah, he's parks and recreation, so it's about providing that trail and um, and and preserving the open space, which was part of what the developer did as well, is dedicate a good portion of the land over there for the trail. But no, I haven't spoken in detail, but yeah, it was just additional costs that he was concerned about. And did, Glenn, did you have any other comments about kind of process uh, if, if in fact the commission recommends that the the barn be retained on site, um, that was was my comments fairly accurate? <laughs> yeah, and Brian and I talked about it in detail um, because you do have two boards that are recommending to city council. You have HP or uh, planning commission and yourselves as uh, as the historic preservation commission. I believe both those recommendations were presented to city council. Um, they weighed them and they accepted the uh, um, recommendation from, or, uh, from the planning commission. And at the end of that, it says um, reference, historic references to be included in development of the site with implementation in accordance with the historic preservation commission and city staff. So it kind of gave you another shot at it. And I think that's, what we're doing here. If the applicant, I think, doesn't agree with your recommendation, I think Brian's right. We go back to council as the decider, basically. All right, thank you. Hey, Commissioner, sorry, Commissioner Lane, uh, I believe the one of the design from member for the design team, Tanner Kinney, is on the call. Yeah, right, yeah it looks like you have your hand up. Go ahead and yeah, good evening. Also, I'm a little late. Um, one thing I, I haven't heard mentioned and, and want to bring back up, and then maybe it was earlier, um, that barn is uh, in the floodplain. So any improvements structurally to this will have to get reviewed separately. Um, we do know that there could be environmental hazards in that floodplain with that building as is, um, especially if it does flood out and fall down. Uh, it could be potentially pose some hazards that would be of concern uh, to such as FEMA. Uh, but that is one additional wrinkle in all this that needs to be considered, uh, in my opinion, that uh, again, this barn is in a, in a condition that uh, we would have any improvements we make or would have to make to keep it uh, would have additional reviews um, inside that floodplain. So Tanner, just to update you, I know you weren't on the call, but I did speak with Monica Bordellini, who's our floodplain administrator. And she mentioned that that floodplain is not a FEMA floodplain, so it's a okay. local floodplain. And so it would be under the city's jurisdiction to make a determination on what, what would be required in terms of stabilization or improvements to the barn. Okay. Thanks, uh, Commissioner Norton, you've got your hand raised. Um, so from previous conversations, I believe I remember that the landowner has owned this property for at least a decade and it sat vacant. Part of the reason that we are at the point where we are is because there hasn't been any sort of um, ongoing maintenance to these buildings. 
I don't understand how the city allowed that. I, I, as a landowner in Longmont, I'm not sure that I would be allowed to just let my property sit derelict for a decade. Um, but I, I think some responsibility needs to be taken for that um, when you're thinking about the historic preservation of this. Um, I, I think that that has been a, um, an ethical thing to do um, to this property. And then for us all to turn around and say it's too expensive to preserve um, and to walk away from it. And, and I, just if I could just interject, I know that um, I did speak with an individual who did approach the property owner, uh, and this was probably five years ago or so, who had an interest in purchasing the property and rehabbing the house and all the out structures at that time. But because of the zoning on the property, the property owner was asking a lot more than what he could afford in terms of purchase of the property since it was commercially or industrially zoned. In terms of your comment regarding the city not enforcing maintenance, that's, I mean, I, yeah, like I said, I don't know the history on that and whether we've had, I don't know exactly how long we've had a property maintenance code, but it, typically a lot of times that's, you know, based on staff availability to enforce all of that as well and complaints that we receive, so. All right, thanks, Brian. Uh, any other questions or comments to be made? Then we are being asked for a recommendation. Well, I move we recommend more looking into the price of just maintaining, you know, keeping, getting the barn not up to code, but sound enough to, you know, a, a new roof, new paint job um, before approving. So would that be basically a motion to request the applicant to provide a, a, a structural well, stabilization cost only yes. and come back to us with, with that information in our next hearing, if that's possible. Yeah. And I know that costs money to you guys. I'm sorry, but um, it does seem like a reasonable request. Okay. Uh, so we have a motion on the floor, Commissioner Hardy's. I, I'd just like to, to comment that if we request that kind of a report, that it be prepared by a historic preservation architect and not uh, not by a, uh, an engineer or other party who's, who's not experienced in, in preservation issues. So, uh, Commissioner Hardys, could you maybe uh, perhaps suggest a, a um, altered amendment then, um, just so we have some sure. visual? Uh, and I would only request that you add uh, a preservation architect or engineer. There are there are engineers that are very well versed. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah. I would um, amend that motion to require that the the additional study and report be prepared by a historic preservation architect or engineer. And is that uh, amendment acceptable to uh, Commissioner Goon? I have no idea of costs. <laughs> I, mean, I, I don't know what the difference in costs in architects and engineers are, but you know, I, I, I just want something reasonable that can be done. So maybe I will withdraw my amendment or my motion and, and Commissioner Hart, maybe you can just start fresh, start a fresh one and we can go from there. All right, fair enough. Let's do that. That's cleaner. And then I, I move that we recommend that the applicant, uh, prepare a, a new uh, or supplemental report on the condition of the barn and the, the uh, potential cost of stabilization and securing it to be prepared by a qualified historic preservation architect or engineer. Okay, we have a motion on the floor. I'll second. All right. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? 
No. Uh, then, uh, Ms. Yost, can you uh, call the roll for us, please? Chairman Lane. I'll vote yes. Commissioner Hardy's. Yes. Commissioner Norton. Yes. Commissioner Goon. Yes. Commissioner Jacoby. Yes. Commissioner Sibley. Yes. Thank you. All right, so that motion passes unanimously. Uh, and that is our um, recommendation at the time being. I, I hope that the app, I, I realize that this is a cumbersome process, but I hope that the applicant, you, you get some sense of how important we feel like this piece is in part because of that history. Um, you know, it's a strong component and we're trying to, everything we lose is gone forever. So, um, Thank you for joining us and hope that you, in fact, follow that recommendation. I just want to make certain that you guys have, you guys have the history, you, the architect and the builders, you guys have the history that we received? Yeah, they, they would have that. Yeah. yeah. All right, well, then I will uh, go ahead and close uh, that particular agenda item. Um, and we'll move on to our next item, which is a series. Uh, let's see, new business uh, item 8A would be HPC code amendments and design guidelines update. All right, well, thank you commissioners for the uh discussion on the previous item. Um, so just a quick update. Uh, you guys may have some questions. I know uh, Sharon O'Leary provided some public comments earlier under public invited to be heard regarding this topic. Uh, as mentioned at the uh, last month's meeting as part of the commission's discussion, uh, the commission removed the, removed, reviewed, sorry, reviewed the uh, HBC retreat minutes from March of 2021. And we continued that discussion in terms of kind of what the commission's priorities and interests were, particularly for this year and kind of going forward. And uh, as noted towards the end of the meeting, and I think they were kind of captured in the, the meeting minutes that you approved earlier uh, during this meeting, was that the, the main priorities obviously are the code amendments, the neighborhood design guidelines and developing a community historic preservation plan, which preservation plan is another topic on the agenda. Um, and, uh, and then there was other things identified as time and staff resources permit. Um, and then also, as I mentioned at last month's meeting, we have hired a consultant to help us with the rewrite of the code amendments. And we did have a conversation regarding a number of topics with the code consultant uh, late last month, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, there's a number of uh, policy topics that I mentioned at last month's meeting that we need to discuss with city council and get, get direction on before we complete the drafting of the uh, the code amendments, and uh, some of those are outlined in the uh, in the staff communication. And I'm happy to, if you have any questions about that, happy to chat with you about that. Uh, so, our next step, um, obviously, we don't have a red line for the commission to review, but we're working on that. Uh, we need to have a discussion with city council regarding uh, certain policy topics to get direction because we don't want to go down a path with the commission and then hear back from the council that, well, we're not interested in considering that. So we'd like to get direction from the council first so we know we're headed down the right path. So um, as noted in the communication, I think our target still this year is to complete the, the amendments uh, during the second or third quarter of this year. Um, and um, I know we're also gonna be talking with the council and getting some direction also regarding uh, the design guidelines topic as well in terms of kind of the scope and applicability and uh, a variety of different topics related to that. So, 
So that's basically kind of a quick update in a nutshell. I don't know if you have any specific questions or comments at this point in time. Thanks, Brian. Uh, any com comments or questions from commissioners? I know, I know you're anxious to get moving forward and I know things were delayed last year. And, uh, so we're, we're trying to move it forward as, as quickly as we can. We appreciate that. And we have at least one person in the, um, citizen, in the outer citizenry that uh, reminds us every month that we're not moving fast enough, so. I understand, yes. <laughs> Completely understand that. I certainly appreciate the, the commission's interest in these topics. Okay. Um, well, yeah, if we can just keep getting, you know, an update uh, as to status uh, at every one of these hearings, that would be uh, helpful. Uh, sure. Yeah, happy to do that. As we have more information to share, we're certainly willing to share it. Okay. Uh, well, if there are no other comments or questions on that particular item, we'll move on to item B, which is the historic preservation plan. Okay. Yeah. And last month we talked about this item as well. And I know, um, it's, it's one of the uh, one of the priorities for the commission. And I know before Jade left, she had actually been working on a potential grant application. I'm not sure if it was ever submitted uh, for a state historic fund grant. Uh, I saw a draft in one of our folders. Um, I don't know, Holly, if you know if it was ever submitted through the state historic fund grant process. Um, I believe she submitted it to the CLG grant process. Um, oh, okay. and unfortunately, I think it, it wasn't chosen. So Okay, thank yeah. you. Um, and so what I wanted to do was just have a kind of a brief discussion. I provided some examples that I just ran across it locally uh, with Boulder, Louisville, and Lafayette, uh, which all seemed like, uh, you know, kind of similar in their scope. Uh, you know, they talk about kind of the community's history and the historic background of the historic preservation program, community outreach efforts related to preservation and preservation grants, uh, goals and objectives, and then implementation strategies and timelines. Um, I don't know if the commission is aware, but one thing that's pretty about Louisville's program is that they actually have a dedicated sales tax, I think of a quarter of a percent for preservation programs. So they've been able, able to utilize that for some uh, pretty neat uh, preservation projects in their community. And so um, just wanted to see if, uh, you know, the examples that I provided in the PAC were generally kind of along the lines of what the, the commission was thinking in terms of what our objectives were in terms of a preservation plan for, for Longmont. Right. Right. Uh, Thanks. Thanks for that. I'm, I'll have to say I, I wasn't able to spend quite as much time digging through all those, uh, it, it, you know, in the short time until we got this meeting. Um, I'd like to spend some more time on it and, and maybe have this topic yeah. come up on the agenda next month where maybe I'd ask commissioners to really spend a little more time with those plans and, and come back with, you know, maybe a little more specific outline uh, of what, you know, what we liked and or didn't find appropriate, but, but certainly if there's any immediate comments from it, from anyone, I'd be happy to open that up now. Yeah. And I think that's a good suggestion, Commissioner Lane. Uh, I know, you know, obviously you didn't have a lot of time to digest this and we could certainly bring this back for the May meeting for discussion. Great. Any immediate uh, reaction or comments here? No, so let's do that. Let's let's plan on having uh, this on next month's agenda. With and then I, again, I'd ask the uh, commissioners to do a little more deep dive into those three plans provided, and uh, you know, be able to make comments uh, regarding what what we think might be appropriate for for Longmont. Uh, hey, and and if, I, if you might, if I don't mind, I don't mind. I just wanted to. Uh, I should, probably should have just included a link as opposed to all the pages. I don't know what your preferences and. and <laughs> And, and rather getting all the documents as part of the packet, or if you prefer just to have a link to the plans. I don't know if you have, care one way or the other. It, it didn't matter to me. Okay. Yeah, right. doesn't, doesn't look like anybody. Yeah, either way. Yeah. Um, okay, great. Well, that's very helpful. Uh, gives us some, some baseline to start with. 
Uh, and then we, again, we can continue that discussion. And I guess I, I would just want to be mindful of any uh, grant opportunities out there to fund this plan, you know, fund the, the consultant that would be required to put this plan together. Um, would like to not lose track of, of those opportunities. I think Jade was pretty rushed at the end of uh, last year trying to come up with uh, come up with that. And that may or may not had any effect on whether the fact that we didn't get it, but um, let's just and be more aware. And I know we're hoping to put together kind of a schedule of potential available grants that we could share with the commission. And we can talk about that at the next meeting as well, if we have that available. And then we can kind of talk about timeframes and what's, I mean, what's realistic in terms of timeframes, because I know it takes a while to prepare these grant applications. And I know History Colorado in the past, at least, has had an opportunity for uh, different jurisdictions to share their draft grant applications and get feedback before they make a formal final application. And so I think, you know, in order to uh, have a good submittal, I think that would be something that we certainly want to pursue if at all possible. Agreed. Well, that sounds great. I, I, I like the idea of, you know, having those grants out on the table to discuss as well. Sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, item C was uh, Historic Preservation Month, which um, is this May. And uh, Brian, you provided a, a, a memo here for us uh, with some information on the museum staff and, and their plans and um, the Callahan House. At one point, uh, sort of pre-COVID, we had talked about getting this commission to get a little tour of the Callahan House. So I don't know if that's still something that's people are interested in or or what but yeah let's is there anything you want to just kind of overview us on on uh on the preservation month yeah i'll be quick on this like as mentioned in the communication typically we do a proclamation with city council uh, regarding historic preservation month um i know in the past we've also both the museum staff and former planning staff i know karen bryant did a number of historic walking tours in both the uh, downtown historic east side and west side neighborhoods. And then Eric Mason, who's the curator at the museum has also done the walking tours as well. And I, he has some plan for this June. There's none currently planned for May, uh, but uh, there are several that are planned for uh, the month of June, including the downtown area, as well as the historic corridor along Third Avenue. And then also, um, Jennifer and I met with Kathy uh, Corpola, who's the Callahan House Manager, uh, a couple of weeks ago to talk about a, uh, they got a fairly large grant from the State Historic Fund for some preservation work or uh, on the uh, restoration work, I should say, on different aspects of the, uh, the Callahan House. One large component of that is restoration of the original driveway. Uh, which is pretty unique if you've ever seen pictures of that. Um, and then also uh, some work on the stained glass windows as well and a few other components. And we actually invited Kathy to come to the May meeting uh, and she's accepted that just to provide a kind of a overview of the Callahan house and then also talk a little bit about these restoration uh, uh, programs uh, that are kind of underway. Uh, with uh, grant funding through the State Historic Fund. I believe the grant that was received was around $180,000. And then the city provided $60,000 of matching funds for that work. So, um, so I'm sure, Kat, you could, you know, maybe at next month's meeting, uh, May, I think it's May 5th, you, we could talk about whether or not the, the commission's interested in, in having a tour of the Callahan House. And obviously there's other uh, city owned facilities that are also uh, historic landmarks and several that are on the national register such as the Firehouse Art Center and then also the, the uh, Carnegie Library. Um, so, and then, yeah. so there's, there's a few other uh, city owned historical landmarks as well. One being out at the Sandstone Ranch, the uh, Morris Kaufman House, which is the visitor center out there if anybody of you have been out there. Pretty, pretty neat place. Uh, so aside from that, uh, just wanted to see if the commission had any other 
ideas or suggestions. You know, obviously staff doesn't have a lot of time to prepare, to prepare events, but if there's anything else that you're aware of that's going on in the neighborhoods, uh, whether that's historic east side neighborhood or anywhere else in the community that might have something in relationship to historic preservation, um, yeah, just let us know. We can certainly uh, put that information on our website. Great, thanks, Brian. Uh, Commissioner Kobe. Yeah, um, I don't know if you're aware. Uh, I was involved. I basically made a tour of the historic East Side neighborhood. It's okay. a very involved tour. It's a three-hour-long tour. But Is that like Gilligan's it, Island? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what I thought of. But uh, it's not as disastrous as the SS Minnow. I did <laughs> surveys, and I, I got glowing reviews. Uh, people loved the tour. Um, it is very long, and it's not for everybody, but I put it online as well. And anybody can do the tour at any time in little bits. And it has a lot of history of Longmont in it. And I've approached Eric Mason and uh, asked last year during the 150th celebration, can you advertise this with everything else? He said, no, because the Historic East Side Neighborhood Association is, which technically I, I did it under that umbrella, um, is not officially part of the city. So there's no way that I can advertise this tour as being available um, right now that I know of without putting ads in the paper and at personal expense. And if there's some way we can put the, get word out that this tour is available online, um, I mean, you just go to the Historic Eastside Neighborhood Association webpage, which is hina80501.org, and you can click on tour and you can see the tour. I have the whole script there. You can click on the map of the tour, um, but I can't get the word out. And I'm not sure what I can do be because everybody who's gone on the tour has said that they loved it and that they'd like to see more people go on it. But I don't know how to get the word out and make it official to get beyond that hurdle of being official. Yeah, thanks, Rick. I appreciate that. That I, I, I think Sharon might have mentioned that briefly to me that you did a tour last year or the year before. And uh, so, uh, yeah, let me check. What, I know we've got a neighborhood resources coordinator. Um, I don't know, like I said, I don't know if there's limitations on our ability to advertise other organizations uh, tours or events, but uh, let me let me do some checking on that and see if there's any opportunities related to that. I know the, the, the museum has a website that says you can take these tours online. If they could just add a line that says something like, uh, you know, we do not endorse this. This was a privately made tour, but here's another <laughs> historic tour. You know, I mean, that just takes putting one more line on a website. I don't. Sure. Anyway. Sure. I've well, given the tour to over 350 people, believe it or not. And it's amazing wow. that the responses I've gotten, well, they, they start with 350, probably half to three quarters making it to the end. <laughs> but <laughs> the ones who make it to the end like it. So again, if we can get the word out, I think that's a resource. Sure. Know, to, to get Thank you. Thank you. That's a histo, maybe you should call it histo enduro. Um, <laughs> Commissioner Goon, you had a question? Well, I was just wondering if, as a member of the Historic Preservation Commission, isn't he under the guise of the uh, town now? Couldn't that be a an official? This is an official tour now. It's not. It's not just some some guy on Emory Street. Well, that that may be an in. I'll have to. Ch I'll check on that. <laughs> okay. Um, and Commissioner J Jacoby, maybe I'll write you later. But I, I was wondering if. You're very good at writing. Maybe an article for the Times Call about that, um, you know, about the history of that uh, place over on 119 might be a worthy, and we could all sign it for um, Historic Preservation Month. That might be something kind of exciting. I, I don't, people don't know that history. I, I certainly didn't. I've lived here my whole life. I've taken tons of history classes in about Longmont, and I did not know that. Um, piece of property was that special. You, you're suggesting writing a an essay about Mary Dickens and the property out there, but then to say that it's going to be developed 
you know, that that's getting into a political kind of thing that I would, especially as a commissioner, I'm not sure I should be doing. I, I don't know. I don't know that you need to mention the development or, or anything. Just this is, everybody's seen the place. Everybody knows what it looks like and just leave it at that. That's, this is the history of that place. Um, I, you know, it's just an idea. And I know I do not have time to, to do, do storytelling from the information that was given to us um, in the next month. So, and you're a good writer. Well, thank so. you. Um, I found my, I've written to the paper probably more often than I should. You may have seen if you read the editorials sometimes, but their acceptance is very variable. I'm not sure what they would, maybe I should talk to the paper first, see what they would uh, want for that. Yeah, talk to John Donkamp or somebody right. about a, an actual, you know, news, not a news story, but a human life and lifestyle story, you know, not a, not a letter to the editor, nothing, nothing political, right. but um, yeah. Maybe I'll give it a try. <laughs> Any other, yeah, Brian, you've got. Oh, I was just gonna mention, uh, I know that, uh, I think History Colorado is putting together a calendar of events around the state for Historic Preservation Month. I recall um, previously, and I'll have to check on this, that Historic Boulder Roundtable, and then I think Boulder County also had event calendars. Uh, I'm gonna check and see if they're also kind of keeping that uh, going. And that may be another venue, uh, Rick, for uh, uh, if, you know, the round table, maybe it's not associated with a specific uh, jurisdiction that that might be an opportunity to advertise that that particular event on that, that venue. So I can check on that. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, let's go on to item 8D, which is the our future HPC meetings. And uh, we had that little kind of online survey. Um, Brian gave us a, kind of a summary uh, about that, but I guess at this point we, you know, I, is there a desire for next our next meetings to be in person um, or continue online? So just a little background before you guys vote. Um, you know, it probably won't be for a month or two before we actually have the capability. If the, if the commission is interested in going back in person, there's some logistics behind the scenes regarding uh, uh, reservation of the council chambers. That, that hasn't really happened for the boards and commissions for a couple of years with the pandemic. And then, uh, you know, there's probably some new training because there's new equipment since the council chambers was remodeled last year. So there'd probably be new uh, training on the on the equipment for the commission as well. So uh, I know that I think that the, for example, the planning commission may be discussing going back, but I think the earliest they might be going back is in June. So anyway, just, just to preface it. Okay, thanks. Commissioners, any, any thoughts on that? Fine either way. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Terry. sorry. Yeah. I prefer to meet in person. I just, you know, staring at a screen is it's a it's a bit much, but I I'm if somebody is not comfortable meeting in person still due to COVID, I totally understand and I'm fine. Uh, yeah, and I'm kind of the same way. If if we could get back in person, I think I'd probably prefer that, uh, but not to the point. That would, I mean, there are some minor um, conveniences here, especially with people checking in and, and, and getting in if you're running late or even some of the applicants coming in late, but I don't love the, the delays in, in getting public um, here. Uh, and I think there may be, that might be a barrier to getting a little more public comment just because it's kind of, it feels a little cumbersome. So uh, yeah. I, I, I'd like to see us get back in person, but I don't need to push it too hard. For my part, I'm happy to meet you all in person. You know, I haven't done that yet. It's all been COVID. And as far as uh, public invited to be heard, Sharon can walk down to the meeting just as well as calls. She, she knows where they're at. <laughs> Any other uh, comments? 
then we probably uh, need a motion to uh, meet back in person if that's what the direction is. I move that we start meeting back in person as soon as it's allowable through the city staff and training and all of that. Okay, we have a motion. Do I, I have a second it. All right, we've got a motion by Commissioner Goon, uh, seconded by uh, Commissioner Jacoby for, to move back to in-person meetings at the earliest time that sort of works out for the city. Um, uh, Ms. Yost, would you call the roll for us? Chairman Lane. Uh, I vote yes. Commissioner Hardy's. Yes. Commissioner Norton. Yes. Commissioner Goon. Yes. Commissioner Jacoby. Yes. Commissioner Sibley. Yes. Okay, great. Well, uh, uh, we'll put it in hands of staff to let us know when that's the appropriate um, move and and where we're going. Uh, so we would be we're back in council chambers because that work has been done and, and it's operational now. Because it was closed for a little while before we before right. COVID. Yeah, yeah. The, the remodeling has been completed and you know I know it and on, on occasion we met here at the development services center uh, when we had special meetings and such, but uh, I think the normal location is in the council chambers. Okay, great. And whatever is appropriate in terms of uh, training, if it's, you know, I, I guess we can talk with uh, commissioners about it, but maybe it's a, a half hour early start to just get some technology training versus a whole nother session or whatever works. All right. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and then our uh, last item under new business 8E is board recruitment and interviews. All right, so we discussed this a little bit last month as well and uh, provided some updates in terms of some documents that the city clerk's office uh, put together uh, as well as uh, the kind of amended uh, rules of procedure of city council. Um, the city council is interested in getting input from the commission on the uh, uh, potential appointees for their particular commission. It's a recommendation. They're not making the, you know, the, the present commissions are making the final decision. Ultimately, city council will make that final decision, but they're asking for a, the, each commission and board to interview the uh, applicants um, and then also to make a recommendation on the applicants to the uh, city council. And so one of the, uh, one of the questions for the commission was whether or not the commission would like to appoint a subcommittee of two members to do the interviews and then report back to the full commission uh, or to interview uh, applicants as an entire commission at a, at a meeting. So, and so we've got one, one appointment, mid-year appointment that is being advertised for a vacant position. And so that would be one interview uh, only for the commission that would have to be conducted in the month of May. Uh, so we just have to coordinate that for that mid-year. So there'll uh, likely, obviously, there'll be additional uh, end of year um, appointments as well, but this is just for the mid-year appointment that we need to do an interview in, in the month of May. Thanks, and just to clarify, this is moving completely from the city council members being involved at all to only the commission members, whether it's full or, or partial, making that first recommendation? Yeah, normally the, in previous uh, interviews, the, the commissions and the staff liaisons were not involved with the interviews at all. It was strictly council members interviewing the, the applicants. So this is a new layer that council is requested to get input from the commissioners uh, as they make their decisions on potential appointees. Okay, thanks. Uh, any thoughts from the commission on an approach here?
And while you're contemplating that, there was also an attachment, there was a list of questions uh, that was put forth in terms of uh, specific questions that was recommended that the HBC asked to the interviewees, but there's also an opportunity for the commission to add additional questions that you might feel is appropriate uh, given kind of the, the nature of the, the commission. And Glenn, did you have anything else you wanted to add? Yeah, I just wanted to add one thing. A, a part of your decision should probably be based on how many applicants you have. If, if you get one applicant, I, we could just knock it out at your next meeting. Um, but if there's five, we might want to think about a subcommittee doing the interviews and then bringing it back to the board. And we probably have to do like a special meeting with the subcommittee. But um, I think it's April 25th, Brian, is the date that we should know what that number is. Yeah, I think that's the deadline for applicants to submit their uh, applications. I suggest we hold off until May then. Do, I guess is there maybe the is there any sense of whether there's a preference to just have applicants come to an HPC meeting or the subcommittee or is Glenn's suggestion of um, making that flexible based on the number of applicants the kind of the preferred path? I, Kobe? I, everyone's time is valuable and setting aside a second time during the month for interviews in addition to a time for the HPC meeting doesn't sound like a lot, but somehow it always seems to be a lot of effort on people's time. I think unless there's an overwhelming demand for people to be on the, the commission, that we just do it together at the next meeting or at a meeting. Also, uh, I, I'm not even aware of the requirements. I know that a certain percentage of commissioners need to have professional qualifications, which I don't uh, in historic preservation. I don't even know the numbers. So I don't even know what the qualifications are in order to interview somebody. So I think as a doing it together as a commission might be better, so long as the number is reasonable. Yeah, in terms of the, the qualifications, uh, if you look through the interview guide, that's an attachment. It talks about 40% of the commission, at least three members need to be professional, which includes architects, historic preservationists, archeologists, museum curators and such. Okay. Um, do we need a formal vote on this or? Not. Uh, I mean, I think if you want to defer until we see how many applicants we have, we can kind of make a decision at a later point. Uh, and, you know, we could reconvene. Like I said, if, as Glenn mentioned, if it's one or two applicants, we could we could cover it at the May 5th meeting, certainly. Okay. Uh, does anyone object to that approach? Just basically planning on handling it at the next meeting? provided the number isn't, somehow I have a hard time imagining there are gonna be 500 people lining up to the Historic Preservation Commissioners, um, but I could be wrong. <laughs> All right, I think that's what we're, I think that's what we're leaning towards is, is handling that at the meeting, next month's meeting. Um, can I just say real quick, thank you for this guide. This is really, thorough with the rubric and everything. And I appreciate the city um, staff writing this up and providing it to us. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I agree that there's a lot of great information in this whole packet. And like I said, one thing I'd suggest before maybe for before the next meeting, if, if you do have any suggestions regarding any additional questions, uh, as regarding the interviews that you would like to consider or have the commission consider for adding to the interview uh, questions, that, that would be helpful to know. Okay, and is that something we could just uh, email you, Brian? Yeah, just, just send them to me. Okay. Did I see a hand up? Um, or no? No? Okay. 
All right. Take, I look away and then I look back and I try to make sure I'm catching everybody. <laughs> That's the other reason why I wouldn't mind <laughs> being in person. <laughs> can keep my head on a swivel here. All right. Uh, well, we'll go ahead and uh, close uh, that item of business AE and plan on um, addressing it at next month's meeting, most likely. Uh, all right. So then we're down to uh, comments from HPC commissioners. Are there any commissioners that would like to make a, a comment about anything in particular? I don't see anyone. Oh, just a um, quick uh, one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to really apologize to everyone for uh, missing last month. It was a heck of a day. And so sincere apologies to everybody for not coming. No worries. <laughs> Life happens. Um, I, I have one comment and it was just kind of been trolling around in my mind here since the, um, the, the Zlatan uh, item. And I, I wondered, you know, we're, we're all, we had some discussions about, we're all kind of working in this little vacuum, right? And we have this real, in, in case anybody hasn't figured it out yet, we've got this collective kind of hot button about, you know, this barn uh, being there. And, and I don't know if there's an opportunity for, for, for Brian or for Glenn to to find out what the temperature is in other parts of the city about this? I mean, for example, parks. I mean, is, is parks gonna, you know, is there an opportunity to say, well, you know, potentially could we take some of that money that they're having to put in um, the, the $140,000 and, and, you know, split the difference and have some go to parks and some go to preservation would the city in any way be willing to take over um preservation or maintenance of just a structure that's there i think back to i don't know how it works and it's and it's not quite as iconic but you know there's that barn at the base of steamboat that's in every you know poster from this you know from the 60s on and that thing doesn't do anything it's just a barn that's sitting there but but i guarantee you that anybody who's ever uh proposed that thing going is met with a with a just a blast of public opposition again i'm not comparing the two per se but i am but that's an example of a structure that just is there because you know everybody got used to it and it became kind of this little iconic um structure so so it can't happen so i'd just be curious to know uh because i'm sure those folks are going back and and grumbling about what we're what we're asking them to do you know it, or is there support outside of this little group to, to try to make this happen and if that's something you could find out i, I think we'd really appreciate it we can have a certainly a more in-depth conversation with them and see if what possibilities there are that we yeah. could bring to help that happen. Yeah, appreciate that. Um, that that's my only comment. Um, okay. Uh, next is uh, comments from city council representative, but I don't believe we have Aaron on the on the meeting. Uh, and so that leads us to adjournment. I will move that we adjourn. <laughs> right. <laughs> Motion from second. Commissioner Norton, seconded by Commissioner Hardy's to adjourn. All in favor, uh, say aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Formalities in this one again. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. Thank you to staff. Appreciate your time and efforts here. Um, everyone have a good night.